Amen. All right. Great having everybody here today. And really, thank you, Brother Norris, for leading us in that prayer. And then thank you, Bailey and Sammy, for that song and the praise team. Uh, great service so far, huh? So uh, if you're ready for the Word of God, we're going to get right into it here. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 39. And going to 53, and then we're going to skip a few and go on down. Are you asleep? Wake up. Now, if you were sleeping during the song service, you're better than I am. All right, especially that last song. If you were sleeping through that, you might need to get professional help. And so, uh, I wore this shirt last year, a year ago, we were outside. Uh, matter of fact, we built that. At the end of it, we built that stage outside in the back parking lot. And everybody was in their cars, uh, in their pajamas, uh, going through the drive through at McDonald's and bringing food and eating it. I'm not too sure some of you weren't smoking in there when you were during the sermon. I don't know. Hopefully nobody was drinking in there. But praise God, we've been back in the church. We was only out there about seven or eight weeks. Uh, we have not missed a service the whole time. We have been here all the time. We had a bunch of, praise God, you can clap for that. And uh, it's all because of your will, willingness and then also the people that stayed at home and some of you are starting to come back now. A lot of us have got our, both of our rabies shots, I mean both of our COVID shots. Uh, we, we've... Uh, been able to get around more people and praise God for that. We still have people at home watching and praise God for them. Uh, this is Resurrection Sunday. You know, it's all about Jesus. It's not about the Easter Bunny, even though I may be dressed like that today. <laughs> right. Brother Norm back there asked me something. I told him, no, I was carrying a bunch of Easter, colored Easter eggs and fell on them, and this is what happened. So now I uh, wore this shirt for the first time last Easter outside and when you get a better view of it today. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law were here for around Christmas taking pictures and he had one just like it. I couldn't believe there's anybody else dumb enough to have one. But anyway, he had one. So as we go into Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 39, God's word says, Then accompanied by his disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went to, listen to this, and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. This is not, we all act like this is something Jesus only did once or a couple of times. Jesus did this all the time. Matter of fact, when Jesus was at the temple, he taught every day. And as usual, he goes to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He's telling his disciples, pray. They kind of know what's getting ready to happen, although they know it, but they don't know it. The disciples were slow. They were like a lot of us. They understood what he had said, but they just didn't really get it. And he's telling them, stay here and pray. I don't want you to fall into temptation. I want to offer to you, I believe that is something that Christ is saying to all of us. You and I need to pray continually that we do not fall into temptation. You see, temptation comes when you and I quit praying to God, quit staying in the Word of God, when you and I start looking at the world, looking at other people, take our focus and eyes off of Jesus that's when you and I mess up. He said, stay here and pray. He walked away about a stone's throw. Now, I don't know about you, but my arms aren't what they used to be. I probably couldn't throw very much farther in the back of this building. There was a day I could have, but still he was only a stone's throw away. Now, some of you technical people were figuring out, well, what type of stone was it? How big was the stone? How much did it weigh? Get over that. He was just a little ways away. 
and knelt down and prayed. Jesus, as our example, knelt down to pray to God. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Christ being our example. Here we find another example as Christ is there. He's praying, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, Lord, please, if there's any other way. But if not, I want your will to be done. You and I ought to pray when we're going through things in our life. We ought to be praying, God, I pray that you'd take this away. I don't want to have to go through it. But, Father, if it glorifies you, uh, let me go through it and let me honor you with my life. You see, there's too many of us when things start happening in our life that we don't think's right or we think's wrong or we think it's going to hurt or we don't think it's going to be fun or we think it's going to cause all kinds of heartache sometimes we just want to hide our head in the sands instead of saying lord i don't understand this at all but i understand you are almighty god and lord if you want me to go through this help me glorify you in everything that you do in and through me he went on to say in god's word that then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him I don't know about you, but the times in my life when I've been about as low as I could be, the times in my life whenever things have seemed to go wrong, the times in my life when I finally get on my knees and pray out to God, God, forgive me of my sin, but Father, come in, give me strength, Lord, because I need you. That's when God ministers to me. And if God sent an angel to minister to Jesus, He'll send an angel to minister to you. You know why? Because you and I are joint heirs with Jesus. We're brothers and sisters with Christ. We're all God's children, and God loves his children that much. In verse 44, he says, he prayed more fervently. And he's in such anguish or agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood we're not talking about one of those little bitty lay me down to sleep at night prayers we're talking about the agony of knowing what he was getting ready to go through the pain and suffering that he was going to have to go through for us we're talking about that kind of pain and he poured himself out to almighty God Verse 45, it says, At last he stood up again and returned to his disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Matter of fact, we find in other passages, he went did this three times. Here it says he, that he returned to his disciples again. In other passages, we know he came back three times. And all three times he found them sleeping. I want to tell you something Brothers and sisters, I believe the church is sleeping today. You know, the problem is, you and I know what's happening. We know what's going on in the world. We see what's happening in the world. You and I say, well, even then I do this myself. Well, God's Word says it. It's prophecy. We're getting to see it fulfilled. And we had a friend of ours just the other day said, if somebody's going to be living in this time, it may as well be me. You see, the problem is, the church hasn't woke up to the fact that you and I need to understand that we are God's children. God will strengthen us. God will see us through. God will bless us if we'll only live our lives for him. Goes on in verse 46 and says, Why are you, are you sleeping? He asked him. Get up and pray. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray. I found in the middle of the night a lot of times God wakes me up. For years I just got mad because I was awake. I did. I was aggravated. I didn't realize it was probably God waking me up. I thought it was something I ate. I thought it was something else. But then I finally realized 
Lord, you must have something for me. You know, there was years ago that I'd stay awake half the night and wouldn't pray. It really just didn't come to mind. But let me tell you what I've realized over this many, many years is that when God wakes you up in the middle of the night, just give him the glory and pray. I want to tell you, lay there and just pray out to God. Thank him for all he's done. Thank him for what he's going to do. Thank him for what he's going to do this next day. Thank him. i tell you what I thank him for. I thank you, Lord, because even though I've been up three or four hours, nobody else is going to know it. And it works. You say they were sleeping. They were tired. There's no doubt. They were so tired that they could hardly stand it. They were grief-stricken, just as he was. He said, get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. You and I need to pray not to give in to temptation. But even as Jesus said this, a crowd approached, led by Judas, one of the 12 disciples. Judas walked over to give Jesus to greet him with a kiss. He walked over to Jesus to greet him with a kiss. Hmm. We'll talk about that in just a second. But Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? I'm going to go back there. You see, Judas walks up to him and gives him a kiss. That's nothing unusual. But, of course, that was a sign for them to understand who Jesus was so they didn't take the wrong one. And he gave Jesus a kiss and he betrayed Jesus. You see, the deal had already been made. 30 pieces of silver, as we know in God's word. We know that that had already been arranged. We know that Jesus said when he was at the Lord's Supper, he said that one of them was going to betray him and they're sitting at the table right now and they all started arguing about who it was and then they even started arguing about who was better than everybody else. Folks, they were no different than you and I today. When you and I today think we're better than what we are and we think we deserve more than what we get and we think we're better than some other Christian, I want to tell you there's no one better than anyone else. We are all saved by grace. So Judas comes and kisses him. We say, oh my goodness, how, how can that be? I want to offer to you many times, I believe we portray Jesus by our lives and how we live in our lifestyle and the things we do that are not according to the Word of God, but contrary to the Word of God. And we just say, oh, it'll be all right. No, it won't be all right. Sin is sin. Boy, I get so tired of people covering up sin. It's not a litter box you can cover up. You need to get rid of that junk. And the way you get rid of it is on your knees in prayer. Verse 49, it says, when the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought our swords. And one of them struck at the high priest's leg, lashing off his right ear. Can you imagine that scene? That was, we find out that, you know, the good old Peter, he was always a little zealous. But praise God, at least he was willing to do something. And a lot of times it was wrong. I believe there's a lot of us that Christians don't do anything we think it's all right. When we ought to do something to praise God and worship him with our lives. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Couldn't you imagine that? Now listen, I don't know why all those dummies that came to take Jesus didn't realize right then that there's something about him that's different than anyone else they had ever seen. Whenever somebody cuts off an ear and he picks it up and puts it back on and it's just like that, no surgery, no ointment, no bandages, when it was healed, it looked like new. Because Jesus doesn't heal halfway. 
Jesus heals all the way. The first part of verse 52, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the leading priests, the captains of the temple guard, and the elders. Who has come for me? Am I dangerous, revolutionary? He asked them. That you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. Oh, I want to tell you. I want to tell you Satan works his best work when time of darkness reigns. Boy, my kids used to get so mad at me. I want to tell you, whenever we told them they couldn't be out after midnight, never been after nothing good happens after midnight, oh, we were old fogies, which we were. Oh, we didn't know anything. Sometimes I wonder. But I want to tell you we were more right than we were wrong because the things that happen after midnight are the things that God usually is not a part of. You say, oh, that's not true 100%. No, it's true about 99 point something percent. You need to understand. And in the ring of darkness, they came after him. Why did they do it in the temple? They were afraid to do it in the temple. Why did they do it in darkness when anybody else could see? The same reason you and I sin in darkness so nobody else can see. I'm going to skip on down to 22nd, I mean, 66 verse of the 22nd chapter. It says, at daybreak, all the elders of the people assembled, including the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. <laughs> Those teachers of religious law. Those are the ones that know all about the Bible but didn't have any heart to show it. And Jesus was led before the high council. And they said, tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. Does this kind of sound like some of us sometimes? But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the place of power at God's right hand. They all shouted, so are you claiming to be the son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. You said it. He goes on. They say, why do we need other witnesses? They said, we ourselves heard him say it. Then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate the Roman governors. They began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. For one thing, they lied flat out about taxes. He said, render unto Caesars what's Caesars. The other thing is, he is the Messiah. He is not lying. He's telling the truth. Because Jesus never lied, or because if Jesus lied, he could not be the perfect sacrifice for you and I. So Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you have said it. And Pilate turned to the leading priest and said to the crowd, to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. You see, matter of fact, he goes to another court, comes back again to Pilate. All kinds of things are set up here to frame Jesus. Pilate three different times tells him, I don't find anything wrong with him. The crowd yells out, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. I want to tell you, the world today would be fine with crucifying Jesus all over again. But we as Christians need to understand that you and I need to stand up for who we are children of. And that's Almighty God. 
You see, Paul started out in Romans and talked to the Romans in chapter 1, and I'm going to read this. Because in chapter 1, verse 1 of Romans, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. I want to offer to all of you today, we're all supposed to preach his good news. Some of you think it's just for preachers. I've been doing this for 51 years, preaching. It's not just for preachers. All of us were called to share and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus died for our sins, and then he rose again. He goes on in verse 2 and says, God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the old scriptures. Matter of fact, hundreds and hundreds of years it was prophesied and it all came true in Christ. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power, listen to this, of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, they might have put him on that old cross. They might have beat him, and they did. They might have lied about him, and they did. They put him on that cross, and they said that he was almost unrecognizable because of the beating that he took, and he took that for you and I. But I want to tell you, when they put him in the grave, he did not stay there. If he did, he wouldn't have been any different than anyone else. But let me tell you, he conquered hell, death, and its dominion, and he rose again and sits on the right hand of the Father and intercedes for you and I. You see, we serve a living Savior. We need to wake up and understand who God is. We serve a living God, a living King. He's a King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is Almighty God. You see, it's time that we finally wake up, O oh church, and understand that my God and the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that when you and I know him, as personal Lord and Savior, that same Spirit lives within us. Let's take advantage of it. Let's utilize it. Let's ask God to do a work in us like never before. Oh, I know it's Easter Sunday. Listen, again, it's not about that rabbit. It's not about the Easter bunny. It's not about the eggs. I do like the candy. It's not about all those things. It's about Jesus Christ who rose again and sits at the right hand of the Father with authority over everything and everyone. Don't you think it's about time we say enough's enough? Oh, Lord, forgive me. I know you as my Savior, but I haven't been living for you. Or maybe today you don't even know Jesus. You've never received him in your heart. Oh, you might go to church. That doesn't do a lot. you got to know Jesus. Because he died on the cross for our sins. If you've never invited him in, would you accept him into your heart today? Maybe today you have loved ones who are lost and dying, and if they die, they're going to go to hell. Because you see, besides Christ on that cross were two thieves. One of them said, have basically have mercy on me, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The other one mocked him, and that same day was in hell because there's no other place to go but heaven or hell. Where are you headed for today? Very simple. All you got to do is ask Jesus to come in, forgive you of your sin, and he'll do it today. Maybe today we're getting ready to take communion today and I'm going to go ahead and read this right now before the invitation because I do this every time that we give invitation but I just want to read you some scriptures in 1 Corinthians 11 when we're looking starting with verse 27 it says so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord 
That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread or drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are sick and weak, and some have even died. For if you would examine yourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being discipled, so we will not be condemned along with the world. You see, we're going to have communion in just a little bit. It's a serious thing. We haven't had it for a long time. Matter of fact, during the invitation, if you haven't got the cups, they're in the back. I think there's some up in the balcony also and on both sides of the table. Feel free to grab those during this time if you haven't got them. But I would like to ask you, let God examine your heart today. You know, I want to tell you, I believe Christians know when we're out of the will of God. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And if you need to give something over to God today, I'd ask you to do that right now. We're going to have a little time of invitation. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to say a short prayer. Then I'm just going to ask you to come. After that invitation's over, we're going to come today and join together with communion. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I just thank you for your son that gave his life on the cruel cross of Mount Calvary that we might be saved. Now, Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to understand really what that means to us. That when we receive you, we're your children, and you love us, and you care for us. Father, help us to bring our lives in according to your will today. Father, we just thank you that Jesus isn't in the grave. He's in heaven at your right hand. Thank you, Father. Bless this time today as we give it over to you. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.